Today, I'm going to show you how to negotiate with a buyer and a seller to get the best deal for your card. Yo, 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 YouTube. Welcome back to the Dollar Box. My name is Adam. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you. We've got a good video today. We're going to talk a little bit about how to approach a negotiation to get a better price uh, when buying or even when selling cards to customers. So the first thing I want to talk about is buying in person from a dealer, because I think this is probably the most challenging way to get a deal done because it's person to person versus on the internet, it's just kind of throwing some numbers back and forth. When I first approach the table, I want to get a feel for that dealer. I want to know a little bit of his personality. Maybe I know him, that helps, or her. Um, and then also kind of observe some other deals that they're doing. How, are they friendly? Are they willing to negotiate? Things like that. That will generally help you when you go to try to make your deal with them. So of course today we've also got a bunch of sales. I packed a ton of them up already, but I have a, a pretty good stack left. So we'll take a look at those and um, get those packed up as well. All right, so our first sale is this John Elway card. This is one of my favorite cards of all time. I already top loaded it. I'll take it out so it doesn't glare so bad on the screen. But it's this John Elway. He's like throwing this missile. It's from uh, 1997 Pinnacle. So a great year for cards. And then you can see the back here. There's there's a sticker on the sleeve. But um, yeah, just a great card. Good image. You don't see stuff like this being done anymore. And that card sold for four dollars. So now we found a dealer we think we can work a deal with. Now we need to check and see if there's cards we want to buy from them. So that's the second thing I do. I start digging and see if I can start coming up with a bulk, especially if you're doing value box buying. So I want to make sure I have enough cards because I want some power in that negotiation. And so the next card I sold is actually a sticker. I got these for 50 cents at the National. Bought a bunch of them. These are the metallic stickers from the 1978 Superman top set. I think this was tops, right? I believe. Anyway, uh, sold this one here. I had them all listed individually. The conditions can change on them, obviously, centering their metallic, so lines on them, marks, stuff like that. But anyway, uh, I had a buyer who was really interested in this, so we were able to make a deal. $11 we sold that one for. All right, so we've got our bulk buy. We found enough cards we think we can get a better deal on. So now it's time to make our offer. So we want to count out our cards, kind of figure out what the, the normal price would be based on their sticker price, and decide in your head what you want to offer off of that. But the key is to leave some room, okay? So let's say, for example, you buy, you find 100 cards, $1 cards. So that would be a $100 sticker. You want to offer lower than what you intend to pay. So if you intend to buy those for $70-ish or so you feel like is a fair price, I will always go up and say, would you take 55? Give them an opportunity to, to come back, um, be part of the negotiation. If they don't come back, great, you get them all at $55. If they come back at 60, great, you were looking to spend 70. Uh, if they come back at 70, they can feel good. They get the price that they were looking to get. Everybody's happy, shake some hands, and move on to the next table. Okay, our next sale is a few Illusions base cards. For whatever reason, Illusions stuff has been selling really well for me lately, so I'll definitely be looking for some of those at the show this weekend when I'm looking to pick up some more stuff. But I got this 22 Justin Jefferson, a 22 Josh Jacobs, and a 2021 Patrick Mahomes. I sold like three of these in the last two days. And it's part of that algorithm, too, where if you have quantity, once you sell one, they start getting pushed, and you'll generally get more sales um, after that first one. And finally, once I've closed the deal, we've reached our negotiation, handed the money over, shook hands, packed the cards up. We want to try to make a little personal connection with that dealer if possible so that you can have future buying opportunities. Ask them where, what's the next show they'll be at. Compliment them on their, the cards that they have. Thanks for the deal. Things like that. Uh, in my case, sometimes I'll give a business card out. You know, If you don't have something like that, that's fine. But try to make some sort of personal connection. 
because obviously that was a dealer you could make a deal with and they had product that you wanted. And that's important for the future. All right, my next sale is a Favre sale. I still sell a ton of Favre cards. I got them priced right because I got a lot to move. So um, I'm always happy when I can sell them in a, a group, you know, multiples at a time because I don't hardly have anything into them. So this sale was for three Favre cards for $5.47. So there's a Stickums. Uh, 1996 Collector's Choice sticker, um, 96 Collector's Choice Crash the Game October, and then um, 1995 Upper Deck SP. All right, I don't have much to talk about as the seller in that type of transaction. If you're going to be doing dime boxes, quarter boxes, dollar boxes as a seller at a show, you want to make sure that you have plenty of cards in there, first of all, because most buyers will be doing what you're doing as a buyer. They're going to want to come up and get some bulk and try to get a deal on it. Now, for me, most of the cards that end up in my discount boxes are the cards that I can't sell online. So I'm happy to move them at whatever cost. They take up space. I can't sell them online, which is my normal business model. So for me, if someone wants to come up and buy, you know, 50 cards and get a better deal on them, I'm completely happy with, satisfied with that. I can always refill that box and move some more down the road but i'll tell you what i the re main reason i do the shows isn't necessarily for the, the money um yeah it's nice to get some money back you know pay your table fees all that kind of stuff but i mainly do it to try to make some connections i have a few buyers that will come to a show i'm at just because i have specific things they're looking for um, i have regular buyers at the ki show that come and look through my dime boxes uh, they know what I have generally um, and feel like they find stuff that they're looking for. So you want to try to create that customer base. So keep that in mind. It, don't always have to try to squeeze every penny out of everything. Sometimes there's value in building a customer. Uh, that being said, make sure that you understand what you have in your boxes, what they are valued at, and what would be a good negotiating spot for you to come together with a deal from the buyer because you don't want to upset a, upset the buyer either. Um, and I kind of approach things basically the opposite way I do as the uh, as the buyer side. Uh, you know, I let the buyer pick through. I let them kind of make the first offer. You know, hey, I got 20 cards. Should be five bucks. I'll give you a three bucks and I'll come back and I'll say, eh, do it for four. Try to meet them in the middle somewhere. They get a little better deal feeling better, better, good about it. You get a little bit more than what they were looking to offer and you should be good to go. I have a lot of buyers that only buy a few cards and they pay the sticker price. So you'll be able to make up, um, you know, discounts and things like that on, on bulk when you're selling some smaller stacks to people that aren't going to get a, an extra deal on it. My next sale is a Barry Sanders card. It's this 1996 six playoff trophy contenders. Now this may not look like much cause it is a base card, but you don't see these very often. And I know that because of doing all the Favre stuff over the years, I don't see a lot of 96 playoff trophy contenders. So where this might show up in a 50 cent box and you're going, I don't know, well, you know, where's, where's the return on this when I go to resell it? But I got $3 for this base card. So sometimes, you, again, you have to look at not just player, but brand. Um, contenders is, is still around. So there's a lot of big fans of it, you know, the, the rookie autos for a long time are considered the best rookie card of each player. So I think that this is this is the an exact. Uh, I think this is a perfect example of something you'd buy based on the player and the set and the year, adds some value to it. All right, let's talk a little bit about online negotiating. Like I said, it's not as colorful as negotiating in person with someone. But there are a few things you need to do when you're approaching an, an offer. So let's say you see a lot on eBay for $100. Let's say it's $500 or it's 500 common vintage cards, something I would regularly make offers on. And they want $100 or best offer. I I'll pretty much always look for best offer listings only because I always want a better deal than what they're going to list it for. So, and knowing full well that they're probably listing it a little more than they think they're going to get because they're playing the same rules I'm playing uh, in most cases. But I also look for what type of listing is it. For example, this last 
so I'm speaking from the buyer side, of course, um, in this case. So this last listing I bought for vintage, the buyer wanted $120, I believe it was. And I could tell it was like an estate sale company that was didn't wasn't interested in the cards. They didn't take a lot of photos of them, but they were all top loaded. The, the few photos I got, the cards were nice, um, good players, some Hall of Famers, things like that. I knew there was going to be a good opportunity with them. And I can't really find vintage at shows around where I'm at. So I have to buy them online. And so I thought, okay, well, $120, what are they really looking to take? I said, they're probably looking, they probably really want to hit around $90 to $100. I'm going to offer $80 and give myself that little bit of room, like I said earlier, just same, same principle for doing it in person. And they came back and accepted it. So I got a, a really good price on those. It was almost 500 cards, all top loaded. Um, 500 top loads alone. If you looked at 10 cents a piece, you you know with shipping, you'd look at 50 bucks there. So I was really really happy with that. I essentially got all the cards for like 30 to 40 dollars um, because the top loads are something I can use as a shipping supply. So that's kind of the way I look at approaching a buy on a eBay side. I, I have customers that will do this. They'll message me and they'll say, hey, if I offer you four, would you take four? I, I don't really like that approach when selling, when buying online, I should say, when I'm the buyer. You, you can send messages to the seller, of course, but I feel like it just kind of gets lost in the shuffle and people sell on eBay because they don't want the hassle of trying to deal in person. They just want to sale, ship it out and be done with it, get paid. Um, so I really try not to do that. And uh, so I... I I don't really go that route unless there's something I really need from it. Like, let's say I'm looking at the lot and I'm really interested, but man, it's just, there's just not enough info here. I could use a couple more pictures or, you know, hey, where did these cards come from? Something like that. Then maybe I would ask the seller a question, but nine times out of 10, I'm just going to ask them for, uh, you know, send them an offer and see what they, what they say. If they'll take my, my offer or counter at something that I feel is representative of what I would be willing to pay. All right, so the next sale is pretty interesting. I sold two of these 2020 Patrick Mahomes Rookies and Stars. The buyer made me an offer on one at $3.50, which I accepted. I'm asking $3.99 for it. Then the buyer came back and bought the other one at $3.99. I don't know why they didn't offer me $3.50 for the second one, but um, kind of nice for me because they paid for them separately, so it covers that extra $0.30. Cent. Um, transaction cost that was incurred because they didn't pay for them together. But anyway, so I've got basically four dollars for one and three fifty for the other. Also, I got these. These were part of my buys from my um, local card shop where I went one day and spent a, a bunch of money there. I should have really recorded that. I regret that to this day. But anyway, he had these marked at a dollar a piece. Um, this one was marked too. I don't know where the sleeve went to this one, but anyway, they were both marked with a big a big one on there. I, um, I got a little bit of a discount um, from the card shop, so made some pretty good profit on these in the end. The earlier Mahomes stuff is worth spending up a little bit more for. I, in my experience, the sales, um, you can get more money on the sale than like a 2023 base card. Each year they play, the base cards kind of dwindle down a bit. People want rookie cards. Uh, Patrick Mahomes rookie cards are extremely expensive, so they want first year cards, second year cards, things like that. I learned that with the with doing Brady. I sell a ton of like second and third year Brady cards for for pretty good money. And the last thing I want to talk about negotiating prices is probably what's most relevant to this channel and that's selling online as a as a seller how do you negotiate online? I get offers all day long, all night long. Uh, I think I've mentioned before, at least I have in the live episodes. Sometimes I get up in the middle of the night um, and I will check my phone. I'll respond to some offers, things like that, because if there's offers you can send, uh, meaning that they looked at the, the page view and they're interested in the product, things like that, you want to try to get that buyer as soon as you can, because they'll probably just move on and buy something else. Intention spans shopping online are very short, and there's lots to choose from. That's how I view it. So I try to stay on top of that. Plus it's just, again, good customer service. Someone's interested in a product, you send them an offer to get a good deal on that buy. That being said, let's say someone sends me an offer. Let's say I'm asking $5 for the card and they send me an offer for a dollar. I know some sellers who will just completely shut that down and say, no, how, 
how dare you offer me a dollar for my five dollar card i don't look at it that way at all to me i just look at it as uh, either an inexperienced buyer uh, who's not really interested in the card they're just trying to get a deal maybe to make their own flip i don't know um or they're just trying to see, hey, how far down can I get the price on this thing? Are they going to come back and say $2 and then, oof, I got the $5 card for 2 bucks? So I kind of have my what I will take off based on what I have it listed for. It's just, I don't know, just kind of the math in my head. So if I have a card listed for, let's say, $19.99, which is the top um, price you can ask for in a standard envelope shipping, I will send an offer at $18 or accept an offer at $18 pretty much automatically. If it's a $5 card and um, they offer me $4, I would take that. So I'd offer that, you know, that dollar off. So if they offer me less than that, that's generally when I will come back and say, hey, I'll, okay, for this $5 card, I'd take $4. So then I become sort of the power in the negotiation at that point. And there's plenty of times where, the, you know, offers get declined and we don't make a deal and that's fine too. Um, but the other thing you need to consider is how long have you had that item? Has it sit around for a little while? Have you had any activity on it? Do you have a lot of copies of it? Um, I think about that too, quantity. You want to keep stuff moving. And is the buyer buying quantity? Are they looking at additional cards? Things like that. Kind of like you would if you were doing an in-person transaction. I look at those before I really re want to respond to the, in the numbers itself. But on an individual card-by-card -card basis, uh, you're going to take some low ball offers here and there. You have to think about those and, um, you know, reply to those in the correct way for you. I don't think you should ever just flat out decline an offer. I think it's a buying a, or it's a sales opportunity, I should say. Um, you want to try to entertain that. If you counter back, you know, it's a $5 card, they offer a dollar, you counter back at four and they decline it. You did your part. You tried to to make the negotiation work. And uh, the, the deal couldn't be had. All right, so I've got a couple more offers we can or <laughs> offers. I've got a couple more sales we can go over. I got a nice one here from last month's uh, continuing profitable um, Sports Illustrated for Kids magazine. So I sold the last uh, six of the Paul Skeens. I think it's Skeens, Skeens. I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, baseball player. He's a pitcher for the LSU Tigers. Um, so nice. Sold them all in a bulk. I got two bucks a piece. I really don't have anything into these. I, you know, the magazines were cheap enough and I can ship them all in one holder. So uh, great, great, great sales. Very happy about that. So these sold for $2 a piece. I got $12 for six of them. Let's do two more sales. So the next one is a couple of Michael Jordan um, promo cards from the national. I love stuff like this because it, it costs good money to go to events like that. So it's nice when you have some items you can bring back and make some money on. Uh, so I sold both of these for $9 total. Uh, the one went for $4 and the other one went for $5, I believe was how it went. I don't remember because they're both combined here in the price on the screen. But anyway, I got $9 for both of them. Okay, and the video would not be complete without showing a non-sport sale. Well, partial sport, partial non-sport sale. I sold these four cards for $11.96. First one is from 78, I believe. Yep, Star Trek. No, 79, sorry, Star Trek sticker. That's Mr. Sulu. This is the one sports card, but not really a sports card. It's a Super Pro. I buy these all the time when I find them. Dime boxes, quarter boxes, they're great card to resell this elf sticker so you got one sticker per pack in the old elf packs and then a masters of the universe merman sticker i think that's how you pronounce his name i haven't seen a seen a sticker with him on it for a while so uh fun fun sale twelve dollars well eleven dollars and 96 cents for those four stickers basically they're all stickers well now the the super pros on a sticker anyway thanks again so much for watching i appreciate all of you if you like this video please give it a thumbs up subscribe if you haven't subscribed already i bring new videos every few days we have our live show on wednesday with me charlie and Stu the goat you don't want to miss that that's eight central standard time every wednesday night hope to see you all there we have a pretty active chat have a really good time with it very laid back and fun 
Um, but otherwise, that's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you again soon.